Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Healthy Soils for Sustainable Cotton webinar series. Joining us today is Dr. Jennifer Moore Cusera. Dr. Moore Cusera is the Climate Initiative Director at American Farmland Trust. She directs the Farmers Combat Climate Change Initiative, which helps farmers, ranchers, and landowners play a role in reducing the growing threat of climate change while also increasing food production, improving soil health, and protecting farmland for future generations. She also oversees efforts to develop state-level policies and programs in U.S. Climate Alliance states. She is an adjunct faculty member in the Crop and Soil Science Department at Oregon State University. Prior to joining the American Farmland Trust, Dr. Moore Cusera served as the Natural Resources Conservation Services West Region Soil Health Team Leader and NRCS Liaison for the USDA Northwest Climate Hub. She has co-authored many publications and articles on soil health management, carbon cycling, and microbial ecology. Dr. Moore Cusera holds a Master of Science in Soil Science from Iowa State University and a PhD in Soil Science from Oregon State University. In this webinar episode, Dr. Moore Cusera will link soil biology to soil health, including how soil organisms perform soil functions and how they are categorized into three broad ecological groups. She will also define biodiversity and take a deep dive into the relationship of soil health principles to soil biology. Her presentation was developed during her time with the NRCS Soil Health Division. Dr. Moore Cusera, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's a real honor to be part of this uh, webinar series, series. And as already mentioned, today I'll be focusing on linking soil biology to soil health. There are three key objectives that we'll cover today. And by the end of the session, I hope that you'll be able to list one key activity performed by each of the three functional groups of soil organisms. The second is for you to be able to list two soil organisms that represent each of those functional groups. And the last one is to describe biological hotspots, what they are and how they relate to key ecosystem functions. To begin with, I wanna just emphasize that soils host vast numbers, biomass and diversity of organisms. In fact, soils are often referred to as the most biologically diverse ecosystem on Earth, and they comprise over 25% of the total Earth's biodiversity. In just over a cubic yard of soil that you can see in this particular slide, there's various groups that are represented, the microbes, bacteria, fungi, algae, nematodes, springtails, and then larger organisms, including millipedes, centipedes, beetles, earthworms, spiders, et cetera. In this particular slide on the X or on the Y axis are the numbers of those organisms in about a cubic yard of soil. You can see that bacteria are over hundred trillion per cubic, meet, uh, cubic yard. The fungi are over 10 trillion, algae around 10 million springtails and nematodes, 1 million to 100,000. And basically, as the organisms get larger, their numbers get smaller. But the story doesn't end there. We can also talk about the mass of soil organisms. And about an acre of healthy soil, there's roughly 20 to 30,000 pounds of biomass. Um, about 10 to 20,000 is comprised just of the microbes, the bacteria and fungi coming in at about 10,000 pounds each. Algae can contribute almost 3,000 pounds and earthworms almost 2,000 pounds. And even the small protozoa and nematodes in an, about an acre of healthy soil can contribute about 600 pounds to that overall biomass. Um, what's shown here is that in about two and a half acres, that biomass equates to about 20 cows. So as you walk across the soil the next time, please recognize that the life force that's below your feet and all of these organisms interact in really phenomenal ways to bring soil uh, functions critical for agricultural productivity. And that's really what we'll be talking about today. 
There are a lot of different ways that we can categorize uh, soil organisms. One way that I found that worked really well with broad um, audience members is what's shown here with these three functional groups. That's the ecosystem engineers, um, a group that's called the biological regulators, and then the microbes, or sometimes they can be referred to from a functional perspective as the biochemical engineers. And there's um, these functional groups perform in a very interactive and complex web-like manner numerous critical ecosystem functions. All of them are involved in carbon cycling and decomposition of plant and animal residues. But the ecosystem engineers, those larger macrofauna, the, the um, earthworms and beetles, et cetera, they actually create their own habitat and they build soil. They're creating aggregates and pore space for flow of water and, and, and air and nutrients. The biological regulators, they're the population controllers, but they're also involved in carbon cycling. They're critically important for cycling of nutrients, namely nitrogen and phosphorus. And they really prey on the smaller organisms, those microbes, which I you know, tend to refer to as the biochemical engineers, where they take carbon from the soil from, that's released in plant exudates that we'll talk about in a minute, and they transform it into amazing products that contributes to plant productivity. They release nutrients important for plants. Um, and when all of these ecosystem functional groups are working together and they're in balance with each other, they all contribute to overall ecosystem resiliency or the ability of a system to either bounce back after a disturbance, such as a flood or drought, and also to be able to resist the negative impacts. So the soil organisms, as we'll kind of go through, are really critical to helping support the overall agricultural sustainability and our food secure, security on the national scales. The first group that we'll talk about are the ecosystem engineers. Again, these are often the macro organisms. A key organism that's represented in this slide is the earthworm, but we also have centipedes, millipedes, beetles, the roly polies, or the creepy crawlies that you can visibly see on the surface of the soil. The ecosystem engineers also include plant roots because they also help to build networks and aggregates and pore space. So these guys are really critical. Uh, they work in concert to, to channel air, right, and to move materials from the surface to below ground. And oftentimes the macroorganisms, those large fauna or animals that you see at the surface, they're the first to be negatively impacted through disturbances uh, in the soil. And so they, they tend to, their numbers drop dramatically um, when there's a lot of degradation to our soil system. So they can kind of be serve as almost a keystone group of organisms when they're not present in high quantities, it kind of affects the, the smaller organisms and their functionality. These organisms are responsible for shredding, mixing, and reallocating organic materials from the surface to below ground. And they also help to transport microbes uh, around. The earthworm has lots of bacteria that are passing through its guts. Um, as it works its way through the soil, and they can help to also redistribute microbes to help with that decomposition process. The next group are the chemical processors or those biochemical engineers. These are really the soil microbes, and they include bacteria, fungi, and in this particular case, the protozoa. They regulate over 90% of the flow of carbon in, in the soil, and they're critical for building soil organic matter and aggregates. In fact, uh, more current uh, research suggests that the microbial necromass, or those dead microbial cells, are really critical drivers of forming stable organic matter. So how we improve organic matter, how we build organic matter in our soils, really is driven by the actions and the interactions of the soil microbes. So what is fueling it at the beginning is the flow of carbon from photosynthesis that's leaking out through the plant roots and they're creating different biochemicals that help the plants grow. 
these microbes transform those products into substances, chemicals called plant growth promoting chemicals, such as hormones. They also release chemicals that help protect the plants against disease and pathogen pressures, and also different chemicals that help plants deal with environmental stressors, such as drought. Structurally, bacteria and fungi are relatively boring structures, right? They're just circles and rods in the soil. They're microscopic. At least the bacteria are. The fungal hyphae then uh, can be visualized um, by our eyes, but they're individually microscopic organisms. But they pack a real punch, and they're really the drivers and the transformers, those chemical bioengineers in the soil, creating a, a lot of amazing products uh, for plant growth. This image is showing uh, saprophytic fungi that are attacking uh, the it looks like root material in the soil. They form a net-like structure. They're important for aggregation. And the fungi and bacteria both have a whole arsenal of enzymes that help them break down those plant and animal residues, converting them into such products as plant available nitrogen and phosphorus sources. The protozoa are also included in this uh, group as well as the next group as we'll see in a minute. In this case, they're also important in transforming and regulating that flow of energy. They love eating bacteria, and when they do so, they take that carbon, they take some of the nitrogen and phosphorus, but they ultimately rele release a net balance. And so they're critical for releasing forms of nitrogen and phosphorus important for plant growth. But all the microbes work collectively to transform the plant and animal residues that the larger organisms that shredded and mixed um, from the surface layers again into really critical biochemicals important for plants. The third uh, functional group are the biological regulators. These are like the population controllers where they control how many organisms exist through predation and consumption. So I can show in this particular slide a variety of organisms. This is another uh, slide image of a protozoan. The green blobs inside of this protozoan are actually dyed uh, bacterial cells. And just to give you an, an impression of the amount that the single-celled organism can consume, one protozoan can consume millions of bacteria in a single day. And again, a really critical part is to keep those populations in check. So they can reduce negative or numbers of negative bacterial populations. And then also they're releasing nitrogen and phosphorus. Same thing with the nematodes, which tend to get a, a bad rap, rightfully so, because they can cause major economic damage to a lot of our uh, crops. Um, but the majority of nematodes in soils are good guys. They also help to regulate populations of bacteria, fungi, and other organisms, they also eat each other. So they're very um, critical for that population control. And similar to protozoan, they also release a lot of plant available nitrogen and phosphorus. So these two organisms in particular are very critical for nutrient cycling and enhancing that biological pool of nutrients. The next image is a mite that's eating a springtail. So keeping that population in control, also releasing nutrients. And then two examples of fungi that are amazing in their ability to prey on nematodes, which are enormously much larger than the fungi. This first image is, you can see these small thread-like structures uh, that are released by the fungus. And this particular fungus is preying on a soybean cyst nematode, so one of the bad guys. And they're releasing different chemicals that are um, consuming and decomposing this nematode as it's been basically parasitized in the soil. The last slide is one of my favorite uh, organisms. It's a nematode trapping fungus. And so this is the fungus shown in this thread-like structure here. And the nematode is that dark gray image in the picture. And this nematode form, or sorry, this fungi forms noose-like structures, ring-like structures that 
as the uh, soil nematode is swimming in the soil water, there's chemicals that are released that attract that nematode toward the fungus. The nematode then swims through those noose-like structures and basically then the, the fungi, fungus clamps down on the nematode, traps it and starts basically sucking the life out of it. So you can see that below ground competition is fierce. And when we have a really healthy population that's all working together, it helps to keep the bad guys in check, helps to promote those, uh, the good beneficial organisms and to support our agricultural systems. Oftentimes, the soil organisms are referred to as being components of a soil food web. Um, this is a really simplified food web, but I just want to re-emphasize the complex and interactive web-like nature um, as, all these inter as all of these organisms interact with each other. So again, plants, the energy from the sun fuels the plants through photosynthesis. As those residues break down and are decomposed by bacteria and fungi and the larger organisms help redistribute it, and then everybody's eating everybody, right? And keeping populations in check, they're also releasing nutrients and other chemicals that then feed back to the system to help support the plant, um, plant growth. So in ecosystems, uh, the microorganisms in particular have been found across the most extreme and harsh environments imaginable. They've been found in the Atacama Desert, up in the dry valleys in Antarctica, in hot thermal vents, in the hot springs of Yellowstone, super acidic conditions, extreme heat, extreme temperatures, extreme acidity. But of course, we don't farm in those environments. And in uh, farming systems, the environment where most soil organisms thrive is a much more narrow window. And I kind of like to refer to this window as the Goldilocks, um, where the condi conditions are just right. And in this particular case, what I'm talking about um, is illustrated on this graph, where on the x-axis is uh, any particular soil variable, pH, temperature, water, oxygen conditions. And on the y-axis could be activity, microbial activity, microbial biomass, microbial numbers. And in agricultural systems, uh, the biodiversity and activity of soil organisms is in a narrow kind of bell-shaped curve where conditions on either extreme kind of lessen the ability of those microorganisms to thrive where there are these optimal conditions. So in ag systems, that tends to be in near neutral pH, somewhere between six to seven and a half of course, that varies depending where you are and what crops you're growing. But in generality, we can uh, say that the majority of organisms are optimal in that near neutral pH range. They tend to prefer warm soil temperatures somewhere between 60 and 90 degrees. They like soil water at field capacity. So soils uh, field capacity is kind of defined as uh, the moisture that's left behind after a really saturating rain event and two or three days after that, there's still water that's drained from the macro pores. So there's air exchange and soils aren't going anaerobic, but the water is retained in the micro pores to support plants and, and microbes. And of course they need abundant food and diverse food sources. And so the Goldilocks thing is, right, things need to be just right, not too hot, not too cold, not too dry, not too wet, not too alkaline, not too acidic, just, just right. What's really interesting about soil microbes in particular and bacteria is that over 90% of bacteria in soil are inactive at any one period of time. And that's because those conditions aren't just right. Uh, the, the place where they're living, maybe they don't have access to food, Maybe it's a dry spot, maybe it's, a, it's an anaerobic zone where there's not enough oxygen, maybe it's too acidic, right? So they wait for conditions to improve. And the way that we can improve them is through management and, and trying to optimize their environment. And we'll talk about that as we proceed. 
So microbes are greatly impacted by temperature and moisture. So second, if there's food of, uh, present, uh, the two limiting things then that come into play are both temperature and moisture. And so this figure shows the bacterial and fungal activity on the y-axis. And in this particular case, it's uh, the example is in a temperate grassland or cropland over the course of a year. And so as we proceed from winter into spring, things start warming up. There's typically abundant moisture and microbes flourish, right, as those temperatures uh, climb into the early summer. At the early summer, as we proceed back into fall, things start drying out. Uh, the temperatures start cooling down um, as we get to this first frost period. Sometimes, depending where we are, the late summer temperatures are very hot. And if there's not adequate moisture, things start drying down or the plants start uh, slowing down. And then that contributes to this decline before the temperatures take a, a major dip into the, the fall and winter. So the greatest activities right, occur in the late spring, early summer, when the temperatures and moisture are optimal. And then I also wanted to just point out that it never really goes to zero. No matter how cold or how dry or how, how hot, there's some microbe that's just in a resting phase. It's just waiting for conditions to, to become better. Um, and there's always sort of a low level um, activity. But what we're trying to optimize is what's illustrated here through warm and moist conditions. This is a great um, time lapse video I found on the internet um, by the individual up here, and then with the full link to the full uh, video, which I sped up for our purposes here. I like it because I tend to joke that I'm microbe centric. I, uh, when I talk about soil organisms, I'm really emphasizing the bacteria and fungi, and there's a lot of really great reasons to do so but it truly takes a whole village to raise a crop or to support a, an ecosystem. And this illustrates that really well. On the right-hand side, what they've done is, is taken forest litter and time-lapse it over a 15-week period. And on the right-hand side, they kept all of the soil fauna, the soil um, animals and the microbes present to do their decomposition and work their magic. On the left-hand side is that same litter, but they removed all of those soil organisms. And so you can see how much slower that was occurring. On the, um, in the previous slide, you could actually see the earthworms channel and you can go and watch that video. Here you can see the earthworms coming up and different uh, organisms all contributing. On the left-hand side, then again, things are happening. There's fungal, uh, spores forming and hyphae and they're beginning to decompose, molds are growing, bacteria are doing some decomposition, but you can see how much slower it's proceeding. Again, here's that visual from the right-hand side, really active, very diverse organisms, organisms that are taking that litter material, bringing it down under the ground. Um, and when they're doing it, they're increasing that surface area. So even though this is an example from a forested system, what we can see is the same thing in agricultural systems. When we create a litter layer through no-till and cover cropping, for example, or residue management uh, of our system, that creates a blanket on the, on the soil. It helps to protect it. But the microbes and the soil fauna go into action to be able to um, really demonstrate their powers through decomposition and reallocation. So I really encourage you to, to take a look at that and, and watch it in its entirety. It's a, it's a great video. So energy in the soil begins with the energy again supplied by the sun, sun that plants use through photosynthesis to transform that carbon dioxide in our atmosphere into biomass both above and below ground. Some of that carbon is released um, through what's called plant exudates. And so these are just liquid sources of chemicals, biochemicals released by the plant roots. Oftentimes a high proportion of those are sugars. Um, and these chemicals really attract soil microbes, especially bacteria and, and then fungi. 
And then again, where there's bacteria and fungi, there's going to be those population regulators. So the entire community is really um, accelerated and supported through what is leaked out of plant roots. And this um, zone that's immediately surrounding plant roots is called the rhizosphere. It's a Greek word, a rhiza meaning uh, root, and, and then sphere, that zone right around the root. So again, most of, much of the compounds are attracting the microbes and then they use that carbon to then build their own biomass. And in doing so, they're also helping to create organic matter like we talked about at the beginning. The microbes then in turn release other important chemicals, those phytohormones, for example, or plant nutrients that then go back and help to support plant growth. So it's a really nice, symbiotic uh, association between the rhizosphere. The plants are providing carbon and sugars and other forms of carbon to the microbes. The microbes then are uh, supplying the plant with nutrients and chemicals that help to promote plant growth. So that's kind of the one of the key drivers of the biological hotspots that we're going to talk about today. Um, and despite the fact, right, that I just mentioned that most microbes, over 90% of the bacteria, are in a resting phase, there are ways that we can help awaken and keep those organisms more optimally functioning. And these can be kind of categorized into these biological hotspots where the activities can be 10 to 100 times, sometimes a thousand fold greater than in an adjacent area of sort of bare soil um, without association to some plant or animal residues. Again, the key zone that's driving a lot of these interactions and feeding back into the system is that rhizosphere or root zone. But after the plants grow, there's then that litter layer that we just saw that great video showing the decomposition of that materials that are then translocated below ground to create organic matter and that biologically uh, rich nutrients cycling zone. The litter layer, that surface at the top is sometimes referred to as detritus sphere. Detritus is kind of, uh, can be defined as dead plant materials at the surface, and, and in this case, they're at the surface. There's also root channels or an earthworm channel, sometimes called the drillosphere, uh, because those roots and earthworms are drilling through the soil. Then, through the interactions of these three zones, the litter layer, the root zone, the earthworm and root channels, those interactions with the microbes then help create pore spaces or porosphere. And then the last one is a name I can never pronounce correctly, but it's the aggregate surfaces. Um, and as you go through different soil health trainings, uh, likely you've come across the slake test uh, where we, uh, actually show in demonstration uh, the, the disruption of those aggregates and what that means in a healthy and unhealthy uh, system. So a highly functioning soil will support all of these hot spots or, or these sphere of influences. And so we can just go through each one of these hot spots and talk about those key ecological functional groups as well as some key organisms that are associated with each but also keep in mind, these are all interrelated. They're all connected. And if we really wanted to, we could draw almost a web-like feature on this particular slide. They don't work in isolation. They're all uh, integrated with one another. The first one, let's go again, start at the surface, the litter layer or detritosphere. This is a hot spot for those ecosystem engineers. Recall a classic one is our, our friendly earthworm. Other organisms are all those large soil organisms that you can see, the millipedes, centipedes, beetles, uh, ants, termites, uh, roly polies, right? They're all working together, especially um, in forested ecosystems, but also uh, can guarantee that in this particular field where these residues are, are continuously um, present at the surface, that there's a very active population of those macro or large soil organisms. The litter layer, in addition to serving as a carbon source for those soil organisms, helps to protect the soil. It's like you know, the armor of the soil 
protecting it from erosion, uh, erosive forces of wind and water. It also serves as an insulative blanket that can help to conserve soil temperature and moisture. So it serves multiple functions, not only from, for our soil organisms, but also from a physical uh, nature in the, in the soil. The next hot spot is the earthworm and root channels or the drillosphere. So here's an image you can see as the earthworm channels through, it's going to create a large um, pore. These are called biopores. Uh, and they're simply defined as large pores that are formed from biological activity. Uh, you can see here that plant roots, again, are also very important for forming biopores. Some are large uh, in tap roots, like a, a daikon radish. Um, some are more fibrous in some of our grassland species. This image on the right, I think, is uh, really kind of illustrates what the importance of some of these channels are for future plant growth. So in this particular image, it actually is showing an old earthworm channel. And as earthworms pass through the soil, they release materials out the other end. Those materials are nutrient rich, they're microbially dense, extreme um, high activity. They tend to be neutral in pH despite uh, the surrounding area, and they're very porous. And so uh, they also act very like sponges mini sponges in the soil. So they track the water, they hold on to the water, but they also have uh, good drainage. So there's lots of uh, air pockets as well. And so when these earthworm channels or former root channels also are, are present, uh, then the next generation of plant roots find an easy path and a very optimal area uh, for growth. So they're, this particular root is off to a great start compared to one that has to you know, burrow through um, uh, adjacent soil because of that nutrient rich zone. The bacteria are loaded and they're primed and ready to go into action to help that plant. Uh, and also that water and air status is very optimal. So this is the ultimate Goldilocks area um, in a soil. Again, these ecosystem engineers, the earthworms and the plant roots uh, and other critters in the soil mix and move those residues. They shred it, increase that surface area to then facilitate decomposition by the bacteria and fungi. Again, they're nutrient rich, microbial enriched, perfect area for both air and water flow and water storage. And ideally, when they're not disturbed in soils, they form a great path um, for roots to grow and take advantage of. Uh, I always kind of like to just um, emphasize, similar to all organisms, right, we want to support native populations, um, whether it's in ecosystem restoration uh, for plants or also in, in from a, um, a, a soil fauna perspective. So this is just one example up in the northern states, uh, I think in the University of Minnesota, where um, non-native earthworms uh, came into the area and really altered the understory of the forested ecosystem there. There's also examples out in California in pastures um, where shifts in fertilization have altered the, um, the native populations. And so uh, they're looking at how to facilitate and make sure that the native earthworm populations are flourishing because they've shown that the native uh, organisms um, tend to be active at the surface for a longer period of time throughout the year, whereas the non-natives coming in have these big pulses of, of uh, nutrient release, and then they've linked that actually to, to some of the invasive plant species that come in behind them. So anyway, when you're fishing, basically the, the end story is just take that container of earthworms, bring them back to your garden, and, and don't dump them on the side of the side of the river. Um, so we want to support those native populations whenever possible. Leading then to those biopores, um, we want to talk about all of the pore space in the soil or the porosphere. This is a hot spot for both chemical processors, the microbes, bacteria, fungi, as well as the protozoan and nematodes that are helping to regulate those populations. These pore spaces um, are created from the actions of the roots and those soil organisms, 
as well as through soil health management. Uh, they often are referred to as the lungs and circulatory system because it's how water and air flows through the soils. So in an ideal soil, we want about half of the space occupied just by space. The other half is with solid material, the majority of which is typically minerals, sand, silt, and clay particles, um, as well as then a healthy amount of organic matter and soil organisms. But for right now, we're focusing on the left-hand side of that uh, volume of soil, and that space can be occupied by either water or air or some combination. Again, ideally, you want a lot of a diverse array of pores, large pores, macro pores, those bio pores, all the way down to micro pores, because it's important to get those big pores in, in place. It helps to get the water into the soil in a real heavy rain event or following an irrigation event. Those big pores allow the water to get into the ground rather than run off its surface, carrying with it uh, nutrients and potentially um, other chemicals that we don't want to move off, off field. Uh, not only are, is that a negative from an economic perspective, but it's also a negative environmentally in our surface waters. But anyway, as those big pores help get the water into the ground, then they also help to drain that soil so we don't stay anaerobic. Anaerobic conditions are not ideal and they help to support a lot of pathogens that can then flourish and create problems for nutrient cycling and um, plant ro roots um, don't like anaerobic conditions as well. And so again, important for airflow, water flow, storage and availability and those biological highways because bacteria and fungi don't have legs or ways to move. They move through uh, water surfaces uh, through the pores. And just to give a, an illustration of what happens in a compacted soil then, is we still have the same overall volume of soil, but now that volume is compressed where the air, that pore space is smaller uh, and more of the space is then occupied by solid material. That means that then water can't get into the soil and it has a harder time draining from the soil. So it's a, a, double, a double negative in that case. The aggregate surfaces then are directly linked to pore spaces. So where there's not pores, there, uh, where there's not space, there's solid material. And the aggregation and these aggregates that we're really interested in are the combined, um, aggregation, sorry for lack of a better word, of, of those sand, silt, and clay particles in conjunction with organic matter. And this is a, a figure showing that slake test I mentioned earlier. On the left-hand side is a nice healthy soil, uh, likely from a no-till system with cover crops long-term, where those aggregate surfaces are, are formed. And then the biology then helps to glue those particles together. And so the water is flowing through this particular uh, soil ped, but it's not breaking and disintegrating apart. It's, it's holding together because of those microbial glues. On the right-hand side is a more disturbed soil system, uh, whereas the water passes through these pores, there's no glue or the glue is very weak and it, help, and it starts to disaggregate and completely um, fall apart and then you can see that this would be a soil that's highly susceptible to erosion and this water draining off of this field is carrying sediment it's potentially carrying chemicals um, and then that's negatively influencing our waterways these aggregates therefore create the stability and resist erosion they also help to protect organic matter and the microbes living within those uh, small pore spaces and then again we often learn about aggregates as a physical property of soil, um, and it is a physical property, but it's directly influenced and created by microbial and, and other soil organisms, those microbial glues, the fungal hyphae, and dead cells. To illustrate that is uh, shown in this particular slide, where there's two ways that soil organisms help to form soil aggregates. One is through physical stabilization, where on the left-hand side, you can see an image where these plant roots enmesh the soil particles, as well as fungal hyphae. So the hyphae are 
like tiny little uh, root hairs. Uh, they look like tiny root hairs, but physically they're also enmeshing and forming a net-like structure. Uh, sometimes you can think, I like to talk about it like a hair net, right? That's just encapsulating and physically enmeshing those soil particles, helping to keep them in place and to resist erosion. Earthworms, so not just being microbe-centric with uh, bacteria and fungal uh, contributions. Earthworm casts, that material that passes through the earthworms are incredibly important to help create soil aggregates as well. Um, and then again, the fungal and bacterial filaments. And then I just like to point out that on the right hand, lower right hand side, we have uh, a scanning electron micrograph with uh, fungal hyphae. And on the left, we have, um, or in the middle here, this is also a zoomed in of soil particles that are being supported and, and connected uh, through these filaments by bacteria um, called actinobacteria. So it's both bacteria and fungi. Fungi tend to play a much more dominant role in this particular case. There's also a chemical stabilization that happens. Um, polysaccharides released by bacteria and uh, soil fungi help to stick soil particles together. Sometimes that's referred to as um, extracellular um, polysaccharides. And then there's also soil proteins that are released by a whole array of uh, soil organisms. The key one are, are mycorrhizal fungi, but other organisms also release these sticky proteins that help bind those soil particles together. And so this is an image um, from Dr. Nichols that shows the fluorescence of those glycoproteins on the soil aggregates. And those are the part, in part, some of the glues that are happening. Um, other glues are formed just from bacteria. Um, actually, bacteria are negatively charged. Soils tend to be negatively charged, so that creates a problem to help stick bacteria to soils. Um, one way they overcome this is kind of forming colonies where they'll get together and form a biofilm around soil particles. And they literally, literally release um, sticky polysaccharides shown with the red arrows that help stick that bacterial cell to the soil particles. So both chemical and physical mechanisms directly released from biological activity helps to create these soil physical structures um, called soil aggregates. And then uh, coming kind of full circle back to the rhizosphere, the importance of plant roots. Um, none of this really is optimally function without plant roots. So how do we enhance these hotspots? How do we awaken the soil organisms? We you know, keep a living uh, cover as, as long as possible throughout the year. Again, those root exudates, those release of, of liquid sources of carbon and nitrogen, sugars, also chemical sig signals um, stimulate microbes and predators. And there's lots of different ways that the interactions happen below ground. Some are symbiotic, so that's a win-win for both parties. Uh, we talked about that from a bacterial perspective uh, where the bacteria then help to release uh, phytochemicals that help to promote plant growth, and they also release nutrients. There's a protection that can happen uh, through chemical signaling between plants and below ground, where other chemicals released by fungi and bacteria can help to protect against a pathogen, or um, in drought, for example. Lots of nutrients are released uh, in this zone, and that's good for the plants, of course. And again, once all of this is working in concert and a nice balanced system that enhances overall ecosystem resilience to deal better with environmental stressors such as um, extreme weather events and climate change. So just to re-emphasize, kind of going back to my microbe-centric nature, um, in the rhizosphere, the key organisms are, are microbes, bacteria and fungi. In general, bacteria tend to be the most numerous. They outnumber, remember, the 100 trillion of bacteria compared to uh, 10 trillion or 100 uh, million of, uh, uh, a billion, sorry, of the fungi. Um, but they tend to uh, not weigh as much. So fungi tend to outweigh uh, bacteria. Overall, microbes represent anywhere from 2 to 5% of soil organic matter. 
but again, they're collectively responsible for over 90% of the energy flow in soils. A single gram, so it can't even basically fit on your pinky nail, can contain 10 million bacteria and 1 million different species. Uh, and, and then in a mass um, perspective, bacteria can be up to three tons per acre in soil. That upper end is usually in grasslands um, with some of the cropland uh, on the lower end at, at about half a ton. Fungi come in different forms. Three of the key groups are saprophytic. Again, those are the fungi that break down uh, dead and decaying materials. Mycorrhizae are a symbiotic relationship we'll talk about in a minute. And of course, both bacteria and fungi have pathogenic species that can cause major damage. Again, what we're trying to do is facilitate a nice balanced ecosystem, complex web of organisms that are present to help keep those checks and balances and those negative uh, pathogens uh, numbers down. Fungi can weigh up to five tons per acre. And then again, the protozoa and nematodes are in high concentrations around the rhizosphere because their prey uh, is in high concentrations there. Again, they consume microbes and are critically important to recycling nutrients to plant roots. So two classic examples. The first uh, 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 classic examples of symbiosis in soils. The first is shown here with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So these bacteria team up with um, special kinds of plant roots. In this case, this is showing um, for soybean and uh, on the right hand side for clover. The bacteria basically infect in a very positive way the plant root and they form these little nodules. Inside those nodules, the bacteria are active and they're taking nitrogen gas straight out of the atmosphere, dinitrogen, majority of our atmospheric composition, but it's in a form that's not usable. Um, it's inert, but these bacteria take that dinitrogen gas out of the atmosphere. They split that really difficult to split triple bond um, that's holding those two nitrogen molecules together, and they create ammonium that's then released up into the, the plant root directly. So it's symbiosis because the bacteria get sugars that are allocated from photosynthesis below ground to help support them. Uh, they also get a nice protective home that the plant root allows them to create in those nodules. And then in return, again, the bacteria are creating um, the, the, the uh, plant available nitrogen. So very important nitrogen source. And so including these in our crop rotations or in our cover crop mixes can contribute very significantly to the nitrogen status in our soils. The next and second um, symbiotic association I wanted to emphasize is the mycorrhizal association. In this case, instead of bacteria, it's focusing on fungus uh, root. So again, Greek word myco uh, meaning fungi, rhiza meaning root, fungal root association. And these most crops, most plants are mycorrhizal. So uh, that's great. Um, including you know, onions, corn, cotton, wheat, soybeans, potato. The majority of, um, of our crops are mycorrhizal. Some non mycorrhizal crops um, in include some of the brassicas. So in this case, similar to the nitrogen fixing bacteria, the fungi are receiving carbon that's allocated through photosynthesis out through the roots to help feed and facilitate those fungi. And then what the fungi then do, or they increase the absorptive root surface area at least 10 times um, in some natural undisturbed systems, it can be uh, much higher than that. But it, it uh, you know, I kind of tend to teach it as like a root extensions or hair extensions, right? Where, where you're increasing access to nutrients, to water uh, and other necessary chemicals for growth. The fungi are important, especially in phosphorus and zinc uptake. So again, the fungi has these really amazing enzymes and can release organic, organic acids that can mine phosphorus that's otherwise trapped in minerals. 
The fungi are also important in suppressing plants and uh, pests and diseases. And again, as I already showed, they form those networks, those physical enmeshment structures that help to build soil aggregates, um, both physically and biochemically. So this is a slide I, I found that just help emphasizes the research that uh, scientists are diving into to identify how microbes help plants deal with stress. And so uh, you can kind of go at, at your leisure to, to read about this, but um, temperature, there's special organisms that um, can help plants deal with high temperatures. There are organisms that help plants deal with drought, water logging, toxic chemicals, nutrient limitations, pests and pathogens. You name it, there are typically microbes that are um, in existence that scientists are trying to identify and figure out how to optimize their growth for plants to be able to deal um, with these environmental and, and biological stressors. So really cool cutting edge research all across the globe um, is happening. This particular example is uh, from a PhD student in Australia. Uh, same student, then just some images to emphasize this, that uh, you know, when they excluded microbes um, from the, the growth of this plant, they, you can visually see how much more growth both above ground and below ground they got when they added those beneficial bacteria uh, to, the, to the plants. So very important to, to keep the, the balance. But as we already talked about, the competition below ground is fierce. Um, and then this is a, a figure just showing the roots and the influence of uh, roots grown in the presence of springtails, these tiny uh, microfauna, uh, small organisms. Um, and then that this particular uh, example, the, the plant has been inoculated with a pathogen, uh, Rhizoctonia solani. And then on the left is with root springtails, and then on the right is without them. So there's some interaction uh, that the springtails are providing that helps to protect this root from that pathogen. Already talked about the nematode trapping fungi. Uh, here's a mite preying on a nematode. I, I just like the name of these guys, the Vemprilians, like vampires. Uh, they're a protozoan that are eating a fungal root. In this case, this fungi, fungi, fungus is a pathogen that's involved in take all disease, but basically the protozoa come in, they puncture the, the mycelia of the fungi and start also sucking the life out of them. Here's our, our, our uh, star protozoan eating billions of bacteria each day. And again, our soybean cyst nematode that's parasitized by a particular fungus. So lots of interaction uh, and below ground competition. So how can we manipulate the soil microbiome? How can we try to influence and optimize the interactions? Uh, there are a variety of different ways. Again, lots of great cutting edge research all across the, the globe happening, and especially here in our land grant institutions and ARS scientists. Uh, one option is to select different plant species and varieties, um, or even control at various plant stages. So, crop rotation, crop selection, planting timing and termination, for example, in our cover crops influences which soil microbes are present and what their functions are, are involved in. Fertilization, of course, the four Rs are important, but fertilization amount and source and timing has been shown to influence the composition of the soil microbiomes. And so I think that there's a lot of great opportunities there that scientists are, are looking into. Soil amendments, including biologicals, um, are very promising. Um, the biologicals in particular are really fraught with a lot of issues, but while there's a lot of great research that's suggesting that some microbial products can really stimulate uh, certain plant traits. Other amendments, compost, uh, manure, exam uh, for example, can also help to stimulate and alter the microbiome. And then managing the environment to minimize the stress. We need to support those, all of the spheres, all of those hot spots. If we choose practices that bring all of those together and optimize them throughout the year, we're managing that environment to minimize uh, the stress that can occur through pathogen 
pressure, drought, temperature, extremes, et cetera. So in summary, managing for soil biology, the most, um, most of our agricultural soils right now are carbon depleted. So how do we get more carbon into this system? We um, maximize the presence of, of plants um, and we're managing for those hot spots. Disturbances destroy um, habitat and especially fungal hyphal networks. So choose practices that minimize disturbance and support the biology that then builds those aggregates and creates those pore spaces. Bare fallow fields provide little protection, so very susceptible to erosion and no carbon. So we need to protect their habitat and feed the soil. Agrochemicals have mixed effects. Uh, some stimulate, some negatively impact soil microbes. Uh, so really what we're trying to promote is the optimization of biological nutrient cycling and also forming those biological hotspots in a diverse population that can then naturally uh, control pathogens. And a lot of fertilizer concentrations are too high for symbiosis. So that's particularly true for mycorrhizal associations, those fungal root symbiotic associations. Phosphorus uh, fertilizer, for example, tends to suppress or, or lower the presence of those um, um, symbioses. So optimize, again, that plant microbe interactions for plant defense optimization, for nutrient cycling, um, and access to, to water. To achieve those, uh, we can follow the soil health principles promoted by NRCS. The four principles right, are to minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover, maximize the presence of uh, continuous living roots, and maximize biodiversity through both crop and animal uh, interactions. So this can be broken down into two. I, I tried to uh, do this while I was at NRCS where the right hand side minimize disturbance and maximizing cover that really is um, emphasizing the protection of soil aggregates and organic matter, the food source and home of many uh, organisms and soils. And the left hand side, we can do a great job protecting and keeping what we have in place and, and, and its status quo, but that doesn't actually fuel the system. We have to have both parts of this uh, circle together. So the left hand side, we need to figure out how to increase the feed and fuel uh, for the soil biology. So how do we do that? Um, we choose practices that provide diverse near continuous inputs and builds reserves or soil organic matter. Um, how can we provide and protect habitat? We're going to promote uh, that you choose practices that minimize disturbance. So conversion to no-till is a classic example. We're protecting the habitat, those aggregates, and we're also protecting the food source. When we till, we tend to accelerate, uh, especially at the surface, the uh, release of organic materials um, as carbon dioxide. And then additionally, we want to choose practices that support a stable ha habitat from major swings in temperature, water, and chemistry. So that litter layer, that tritosphere, is really critical. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I hope that you learned a little bit about the amazing, uh, complex, and diverse world of soil organisms below ground. So when you take step on your field, um, uh, in the coming days, you'll have a greater appreciation for that entire life force, those 20 cows worth of biomass below ground that's helping to support all of the life um, that we depend upon above ground. So thank you for your attention. Yes, and thank you so much for sharing with us today. If uh, anyone has any questions for Dr. Moore Kusera regarding her presentation, you can contact us at info at soilhealthinstitute.org. And in the next episode, Willie Durham uh, will talk about the soil health planning principles. So subscribe to our channel and you will access those new episodes of the Healthy Soils for Sustainable Cotton webinar series as they are released. Thanks, everyone.